and we've just been astounded by the number of people that we get emails or phone calls from still, um, or that we just meet when we're traveling, or people coming in here who, who saw blackfish, and that made them interested not only in the issues of captivity, but also in the wild orcas and the endangered southern residents. And some of our volunteers are people who've moved here from Texas and Florida to be closer to the orcas. And it's amazing um, to us to see one documentary have that much of an impact. Um, so that really um, just shot all of our educational programs and the Lolita campaign and everything we do just kind of grew exponentially after Blackfish and then getting the Langley Whale Center where we reach a lot more people. Um, that's been wonderful. And now our latest thing is our partnership with the Lummi Nation. Um, and they are doing amazing things and we have some filmmakers from Hollywood who live on Orcas Island also who are working on a documentary. Um, the trailer um, to that is on the sacredsea.org website um, and also on our um, Orca Network Toby Tay uh, Facebook page. Um, so we are hoping that 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 documentary will be, you know, like Blackfish 2 and that focused on Lolita rather than the Sea World orchids. Um, so we, what we're going to talk about today is the amazing month of May, <laughs> um, thanks to the Lummi Nation and their um, photo pole journey for Toki Tai. Um, so I, you want to introduce more and, sure. and how we're going to do most of the, the show and what we we presented up at the Vine Deloria Symposium up at the Northwest Indian College, and for that presentation we were told to not even use a PowerPoint, and that most of the presentations were going to be in the native tradition of storytelling. And the experience of the totem pole journey, um, I can't even talk about it without <laughs> crying. It was so intensely emotional, and it's. You can't just do a PowerPoint presentation about it. So we're going to show some slides and video, but also just kind of interject whatever stories come up as we look back on, on the, the sites we were able to go to along the totem pole journey um, and all that. How we take it from here. And crying is allowed. <laughs> Every single totem journey event. Some of them, everyone there was crying, and most of them, everyone cried at some point during whether it was touching the totem pole or listening to the speakers or the singers or. Or when um, they were supposed to be the speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> some good a lot. stories there. Can um, okay, you do the live stream thing? For what do I do? Well, okay, you keep talking for a minute. <laughs> I just wanted to say something real quick, um, since you brought up blackfish, that these two couples here have seen blackfish 30 times. They're from <laughs> Colorado, and I just think that is a new record. <laughs> so, And they got to see the orcas yesterday. Oh, um, good. <laughs> We're not going to let you lift that down. <laughs> You're a celebrity. <laughs> Well, we should take your picture and put it by the blackfish. Yeah. You know, yeah. Say, yeah. 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 With, your, with your review, you yeah. know. Yeah. We like it so much. We like it so I think that may even be more than we see. Um, thanks everybody for coming. 
this is our title slide and it's ever so appropriate. It was uh, present at every event that we went to and it was created uh, by the organizers, uh, I believe by the Lummies. So we had a lot of a lot of help in a lot of areas. Uh, but I love it because not only is the messaging great, I mean really good to, to hear, but the imagery there in the middle is the Lummi insignia with the globe in front of it. Um, and of course the very vigorous orcas uh, circling around it. But the background, whether inadvertent or not, I don't know, but so this means yeah, okay. um, is I'm, it sure looks to me like exactly where the site is for Toki's Sea Pen Retirement Center on Orcas Island. It's just that kind of scene. So I'm thinking that I'll go with that. So this uh, okay. to look at it and see what's on and what's off. This is really kind of how it started. Uh, this is Nicholas D. Lewis on Facebook, Nick Lewis, uh, who is a Lummi Council member. And it was about one year ago, uh, uh, pretty the, much to the day, that he called me out of the blue <laughs> to me. They had been working on it already for a couple of years, mulling it over, deliberating, making all kinds of contacts very quietly. So he called just to get uh, the history and our involvement, in, and we talked about two hours, from 95 up to date, everything about her and the Toki campaign that we could think of, and he ended up saying, how can we help? Music to my ears. And, you know, I didn't want to be greedy, I just said uh, uh, expression of moral support would be fantastic. <laughs> it went way beyond that. Uh, this is Nick at our August 8th capture commemoration event at Penn Cove, uh, August, last August, 2017, uh, reading a letter from the council passed unanimously in support of bringing Toki home, not just in support, but resolved, dedicated, absolutely committed as a sacred responsibility they need to bring their kidnapped relative home. Uh, it was just incredible. Uh, and this is Nick with Jewel James and Doug James, uh, who are elders with Lummies, and Jewel is the master carver. Uh, his brother Doug also is a carver, uh, singer, and uh, those two were on the journey in the truck with the totem behind uh, for the whole route. And uh, so you'll see a lot more of them. And Nick came to many of the events along the way, as we did. Uh, and this is Bill James, who is the hereditary chief of the Lummies. On that day, August 8th, 2017, telling stories. You know, telling about their people's connection with orcas going back 10,000 years. Uh, well, uh, what does that say? Well, Dolmichton. Well, Dolmichton. I'm working on that. Uh, but as you'll see, it means the people who live under the sea. And they are their people. Uh, so, I mean, it was consecrated in every possible way. The Lummies are doing this. 
It was just, I, I couldn't believe it. And it's been that way ever since. Uh, and this is the journey. This is Wendy's uh, setup of the, the map that showed the journey. Let's see if this will go. Whoop. Okay. That went a little fast, but I'm just trying to do that. Okay, it's just a weak uh, laser. But uh, anyway, so that's the journey from the Lummi Nation north of Bellingham all the way down to San Diego, many events along the way, and then across with events in Texas, Austin, and Houston, and then and Arizona, and, Arizona, and then uh, over to Miami. Um, and this was sort of the, well, there's the totem, uh, and the announcement of the May 10th blessing at Lummi to start the journey. Uh, so that you know, we, we didn't attend that one. Uh, there were several actually, and some were purely tribal, uh, but there were some other more public events. Um, and this is uh, the first step to Bellingham, and we went to that at the Unitarian Fellowship Church, uh, and it was already just uh, so emotional. Uh, this was the pastor there giving her blessing, and, and uh, well, actually, that is Freddie. Uh, but the uh, pastor did that. Uh, you'll meet Freddie, by the way. He's a main player in all of this. Uh, and there is that same insignia in the back, just three of them. But. And then afterward, we did what uh, people did at every step. Every part of the journey was touch the totem, feel the energy of the totem, which of course is cedar uh, and carved by Jewel James. Uh, and I think that's the Unitarian minister in the back in the red and white, yeah. giving a prayer. Right, right. And that's me and the plaid shirt there. Uh, so uh, that was sort of the start of it and, and the feel of how amazing this is going to be. Um, each stop had a religious group of some kind and a tribal group from whatever area or region they were in and an environmental group or more and the Sierra Club also had their um, their different clubs along the route take part in the total bowl journey. So it was really a neat intersection of many different audiences in each event. And this was in Seattle. Uh, we went down and joined them. It was at the Centro de la Raza Center. Uh, and uh, many things happened. I, you know, there were the, the songs. Uh, this was Doug James and Jewel James singing, drumming. Uh, all ceremonial, all part of the ritual of, of blessing and and building this this emotional spiritual bond with the totem and with the journey and with Tokitai. Uh, and of course, there was smudging uh, by uh, I'm not sure a, a tribal member from Seattle. Uh, and this is Ken Workman who is a descendant of Chief Seattle, the Duwamish. So he did a welcome to their ancestral homeland. Um, and this is Hilary France, director of the Department of Natural Resources for the state of Washington. And she wrote a, a beautiful editorial and came and gave this very passionate talk about how we need to bring her home as a part of, of uh, going beyond our dark history and embracing others, diversity and the natural world like never before. And to hear that from the director of the Department of Natural Resources, uh, that was that was real power. Besides the fact that it is DNR that is likely to issue the necessary permits for the CPIN, so she definitely will give it a favorable nod. That was uh, very reassuring to see. 
And this, sorry, go ahead. Well, I don't, I'm also part of what she said and what what is part of the Lummies theme in bringing Toki home and something that we wanted as well is to have it be about bringing Toki back to her family and her habitat, but also to have it be about healing the Salish Sea and bringing back the salmon and healing her family, the Southern Resident Orcas. And through Lolita's journey, you know, bring more attention to those urgent issues and the healing of the, the Salish Sea, you know, the habitat and the salmon, as well as the spiritual healing and bringing her back where she belongs. Right. And this is uh, Chairman J. Julius of the Lummi Council. So he is the, the effective elected leader of the Lummies. He came to many of the events. He also went to Miami in March for a press uh, conference and uh, big meeting there, which was hosted, by the way, by uh, former Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine, who is a front runner for governor of Florida. Uh, at his headquarters, his campaign headquarters. He's a very big supporter. So we may have the governor of Florida on our side in November. Uh, and as he says, Kvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvokvok
the LUMMI programs, all sorts of programs. Uh, and in fact, Lakatimish is their name for themselves, not LUMMI. I don't know who gave them LUMMI. They go with it, but uh, their ancestral name is Lakatimish. Um, and this is, uh, was given out, these cards, uh, the rights of all peoples to share in the first social networks. So now they don't shy from technology and social media uh, by a long shot. There was, that was just a constant throughout this entire thing. Many, many postings and videos and live streams uh, in yeah. all of it. I think they live streamed every event. And we don't have photos from there were so there was a Tacoma Puyallup event and um, another Oregon, another couple Oregon, or, um, yeah, Oregon and California events. Um, they were Arizona on Arizona that I don't think we right. We have but the our um, our shared you know, our shared journey. Right. Um, totem journey. Totem uh, journey. Oh yeah. Facebook our page. our shared response. Our shared responsibility totem is, journey is, journey. Yeah. is a Facebook, Facebook page that has uh, endless oh, photos right. and videos. And our Sacred Sea website probably has them. Yeah. SacredSea.org. You'll see that again. Uh, so this was the event. I don't know how many, you know, uh, Hollywood notables were in the crowd. It was actually organized by the documentary filmmakers, uh, Denny and Jeff, who are producing a documentary uh, that they expect to be a full-length feature documentary, much like Blackfish. Uh, so. And they've made many movies, and so they invited a lot of their people. Uh, and this is Adam Beach. Uh, you may have seen him in the, uh, the Code Talkers, or in Joe Dirt. <laughs> or Smoke Signals. Or Smoke Signals. Uh, and uh, so he emceed many of the events. And he was given uh, these items that drum in the traditional hat. Uh, and so there were photo ops in the parking lot after the event, of course. And that's Doug James. Uh, and kids get to ride. Jeff, that's Jeff. Yeah, Scott, that's. The filmmakers. Right, right behind Doug. Uh, and Julianne Knoll. And you'll see a little more of her, too. In fact, she's coming to Seattle tomorrow. Tomorrow's a big event. Uh, at 1401 uh, uh, Alaskan Way, right there on the wharf between 57 and 59. Hmm. I don't know if there's a 50. Anyway, uh, she'll be there with her mom. They are driving up right now from Hollywood. That's where they live. Um, and has an amazing story, which is that Robin, the mom, was about uh, nine or about her age when they lived in Oak Harbor and in 1970, and she saw the captures. And she was very shook up, just mortified. And so her mother said, if you can do something about it, please do tell your teacher. She did, it, it just caught fire. Pretty soon, there were dozens or hundreds of letters to politicians, especially Senator Magnuson. That was 1970. And that got him rolling, that we've got to protect these orchids from the captures. That, that it, it took a while. There was the Marine Mammal Protection Act. He was a big part of Anyway, they got a whole lot of uh, legal, you know, legislative help uh, to end the captures right there. Uh, so they got to Miami. And this was their first stop. This was before we got there. They went straight to the heart of the matter, right to the front door. In fact, they went in to the Sequarium's own parking lot. I'm sure they didn't ask. Um, and uh, set that up to like plant their flag. Uh, we're here. We're not going away. Uh, we're not going to be shy about it. We want Toki Tai. Uh, so that was sort of their opening volley. And we got there on the 24th, on the evening of the 24th. There was going to be an event at a high school in Miami Beach the next morning, 
but that got canceled at the last minute uh, because the superintendent got worried about the political uh, controversy. Really, it's the Sequarium is, of course, a big business in the city and has a whole lot of connections, and so they didn't want that. So they canceled it. But So we got there and joined the party. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a good sort of, you know, bonding, get together, meet people you didn't know already. Um, met up with our friends in Miami who, uh, you know, we've been working with for years. Um, and you'll meet some of them too. Uh, and in the middle there is uh, Alejandro Dimitro uh, Reiki. Uh, Alejandro, yeah, uh, yeah, Dentino. Anyway, Alejandro, uh, who is a tireless activist, self-proclaimed activist for Toki. Uh, he's out there at the front gate every Saturday with a team of eight or ten or twenty or thirty. Um, he live streams too, so you can find him on Facebook all over the place. What's his name, Howard? Alejandro. Alejandro Dintino. Uh, yeah, right. We'll have it. <laughs> uh, so that's her. The next morning, we went to see the show. Uh, and should work as. Did you cry? <laughs> Would you love me now? <laughs> Their music is canonically uh, appropriate. Uh, <laughs> Right. And there's Susan in the black hat. By the way, it rained the entire time we was there. There was a tropical storm. Alberto was bearing down on us. Uh, it, so that's a theme that was throughout this entire visit was uh, pretty much pouring rain and 20, 30 mile an hour winds. Uh, but nobody was scared of that. Uh, everything went on anyway. Uh, so she showed her gusto, her incredible vigor. Uh, she does five of those complete leaps, uh, some of them two or three feet out of the water. Mm. And the water is not as deep as she is long, so it's just amazing that she's able to do that after 47 years in that concrete box. She's kind of an inspiration. Uh, and she did a lot of looking around, very curious. And the background there on the right, holding the plush orca, mm -hmm. is Freddie, uh, who uh, is a, a great speaker, very passionate, uh, became a, a really good friend, and another lovely with him, Ronnie. Uh, and and so, Freddie's on the council, too. Oh, and Freddie is also a council member, yes. And this is to show some of her energy. <laughs> this is after the show. People are supposed to be leaving. No, this is before the show. I'm sorry. She did it after as well, but this is before. Oh, yeah. Just picking up speed here. Hmm. Picking up a bow wave, or is that tail wave? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a little cool, isn't it? I know, and she's got not a scratch on her, so I don't know. She's got just incredible agility and self-control.
So she's looking around again, just sort of seeing who's coming in. What would you do if you're in a box and people come in twice a day for 45 minutes? At least something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would like to see, um, like Robin and her daughter had never met Lolita other than Robin when, in the, during the captures. And they weren't going to go see her because, you know, we're always telling people don't go to these shows, don't support them, don't buy a ticket. Um, and we've got some friends in Miami that we can use their season passes. Um, but even if you have to pay to go once to meet her, and I told Robin and her daughter, because they're doing so much, I said, you really need to go in and meet her and talk to her and just share what you're doing. And I, I you know, and I, it's all woo-woo and I can't explain it, but when we go, and the, you know, picture where she's just standing with her head up, and she's looking at us when, when we are just thinking or talking and, you know, I went in, I said, just go think about her family and her habitat and tell her how hard and how many people are working to get her home and we haven't given up. And I said, I don't know how, but she somehow can pick up on what you're feeling and saying. And they did go in and, and, and Toki did some really amazing things with them and with us after the show twice, she swam by, and right in front of Howie and I, she did a tail lob. And then she swam around again, and she did it again, right in front of us. And again. nowhere else. Yeah, and nowhere. It was just, you know. Um, and I wasn't too sure how to interpret that for sure. You know, I mean, I want to believe that's, you know, that she realizes that we want to help. And then there was a story about a week ago about an orca that was untangled from a crab pot line. And as soon as the orca got, got loose, showed their appreciation by tail lobbing around the rescuers. So I thought, okay, that must be it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a nice timely photo that Susan yeah. took. Uh, they, they were doing this sort of silly quiz before the show, you know, like do orcas eat krill or something. And then they put that up. So that was, <laughs> no, this is not right. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. This whole picture should and this was a friendly officer, and we thought, uh oh, you know, are we going to get booted out of here? But no, she just went right up to the top of the stands and started filming for her own purposes. Uh, so there really was very light security. Yes, Courtney. Hart, when you're there, is it really obvious to anybody that's in the stands that, that, that that's her only place to swim and live? That there's not like a place hidden that she gets to swim back to or anything? Is it really obvious? Well, they don't say that. They don't know? say that, but it's it pretty clear. It is. It is because it's pretty clear when you're there. See, and in fact, somebody made that observation, and I can't remember, it was in a Facebook post. <laughs> someone who hadn't been there, or someone who just assumes that she had another you know, like SeaWorld has different mm -hmm. places for them to go, and this is it. And, mm -hmm. um, but I'm and curious if people realize that, you know, when yeah. they come, if that's clear to them. I think it's a sudden shock to realize you see it, that that's where she is. And they're really, I mean, just by logic, there's no way out. Right. Unless they, you know, hoist her out with a sling every time. And the USDA ignores that concrete division in the middle of the tank, which you know, basically they just put a tape measure right across yeah. that and come up with basically a legal measure. That's not an obstruction. That she has to swim around the tiny gates. So, you know, it's and they can close that off. If they want to keep one of the dolphins in the back for medical reasons or whatever, then she can't even use that part of it. Right. It's disgusting. And more breaches. Very active. She throws this tsunami up ten rows of seats. I mean, she soaks everybody. It's a lot of tail power. It's amazing she doesn't hit her head or something. It is amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the, the self-control, the body control that she has. There's one completely out. And they do show these scenes from her home of her family on the big screen. Uh, I'm 
sure she likes it. You know, I, I assume that that's kind of a nice reminder. Maybe it, you know, improves her, her spirits and her hopes. Although the reason they're doing that, they've changed that whole show to show that the Southern residents are endangered and that she can't go back because of blah, blah, you know, all the... So their whole show now is, at least they do some education about the Southern resident orcas, which is better than what they used to say. And that's a result of the pressure that's a result of blackfish. Yeah, but they're mainly, you know, answering, you know, the whole show is why she can't go home, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They lay it on pretty thick. Um, they even show her salmon. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad they do that. I recommend it, but you know, it's just in in this narration. It's like a tease of her saying, you know, yeah. she can't see yeah. that. It's a tease of her saying things that she's missing. And of course, I got in a little bit of activist uh, messaging. Bring that on. Bravo. Put that on. The, the hood was down, so they didn't see that until. Uh, so, okay, it was over now. I'm going to go ahead and get kicked out. But they never did. They never kicked him out. I can't remember. We were shocked we got in in the first place. They, yeah, don't they recognize me? <laughs> I would, they, oh, they have. They, yeah. I've been kicked out a couple yeah. times. But, uh, yeah, they somehow missed it this time. I thought they'd be really on their toes. Yeah, um, yeah well, I, it may have to do with the general manager who was the son of the owner quit about three months ago, just with no explanation, no same, publicity. The same week as the big press conference. With the same the week in March, meeting. that's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the only way they know is that Lummi sent another letter saying, we'd like to talk with you addressed it to Andrew Hertz and got back a letter from the assistant manager who had been promoted to manager because Andrew Hertz no longer works there. Um, so yeah. But we did have to go and so we had to leave her, you know, in the rain, which she probably feels like that's kind of familiar. Uh, but uh, so that was our last Look at her that trip. Well, and I, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, Rachel Anderson, one of she and her mother flew from go. Santa Cruz to Miami. And so they went in every day they were there to see Toki. And the last day they went in after all the, our big, you know, march to the Seaquarium, they, some, they picked up on, probably saw her in Facebook posts. And they, were you, it was. Well, she policeman, wrote and, and, and said she would defy police. And then the guy who calls himself the curator emeritus, uh, who's really the bouncer in a lot of ways, he, he came up and uh, said, you have to leave. You're an activist or you're associated you're just, yeah. with activists. Hmm. Uh, and you know, that's illegal. Because they were doing nothing. They weren't even holding up a sign or yeah. anything. In fact, they, bought, they were wearing sequarium rain ponchos yeah, right. because it was raining every day. We right. were there and they, you know, they were being very non, you know. So that was bizarre. So and I don't know, know if the hmm. Lummies or anybody are going to do anything about that. But oh, did an overreaction. Yeah. So that night, uh, we all met at uh, the loft home of a friend of ours, Lawrence Curtis. Um, and this sort of, you know, happened almost spontaneously. They were just going to come over and relax. And somebody said, let's do interviews and performances. So a good five high quality professional video cameras and other photographers were there. And these are the Blackhawk singers. And I'm going to play what they sounded like in a little while in March. Um, but it was really great in the acoustics of this big loft as well. Mm -hmm. um, but they came and sort of set the tone, set the mood for every, every event that followed. Uh, really, really amazing, you know, deep feeling when they sing. I'll play a little. It's gone through you know, a lot of steps. 
to get to my laptop and speakers, but hopefully you'll be able to hear it. So this is just some of it. This is Doug and Jewel James again talking about how they got into carving and what carving means to them. And they've carved many totems and um, done just all sorts of artwork around the lungs. And what I learned, one thing, uh, from Jewel on the right there, was that their older brother was a master carver, but he died. And so for him, it's remembering his brother. He has you know, every, every chip he, he makes is uh, in honor of his brother. And their carving house is called the House of Tears Carvers. And yeah. I think the first big totem pole and journey they did was after 9-11. And they carved a pole that they brought to all the sites that um, where we lost people and did, you know, spiritual healings there and, um, and left the pool there. And then they've done several others for different environmental causes. And you just can't go to one of those events and see the pool and feel it and touch it and be there without crying. And I'm like, I totally get what the House of Tears is about, and then the more stories they shared at each event, and you know their personal pains and struggles, um, family losses, um, it was it was just like a group healing therapy <laughs> experience. Um, but it's just amazing how they started this carving and total journey um, right. event, a thing that that for so many different causes, and it's so beautiful and effective. And that's Freddie again on the left, probably holding back tears. Mm -hmm. So then, the next morning, 26th of May, we went to the Miami Circle, which is this uh, ancient, thousands of years old archeological site, just discovered in 1998. Uh, digging a basement for a condo and discovered it. And uh, after a big fight, it was set aside, made into a park. And so it's a, a sacred place. And a lot of uh, the Miccosukee and Seminole and Carib natives joined us to consecrate Tokitai, the totem. Uh, and those are seals, by the way, eight foot seals that when, when she's on display someday in Miami. Uh, the totem is uh, in Gainesville, Florida right now at a, at a museum, uh, but not on display, but uh, the seals will hold her up. Uh, and by the way, the writer, a lot of people question, isn't that a little sacrilegious to have somebody writing the back of the whale? But they explained that that goes back to the myth, to uh, the stories of the people who ride the whale to the bottom of the sea and are greeted and welcomed and those people in their village at the bottom of the sea take human form and so it's sort of a symbol of those familial connections with the Orcas. So you kind of have to know the story. That's Jewel. And uh, it was raining, uh, and he uh, gave a lot of blessings and spoke a lot of words. Uh, and his brother Doug, they're resolute, they're determined. They're, they've just, they've got this sense that it was just so beautiful to see, to be a part of, that they're going to bring her home. It is a sacred responsibility. That's a quote from him. And they're right on top of the, 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 the business dynamics, you know, and the political. I mean, they're, they're, they're students of this whole issue and know it very well. They've been studying her situation since 2015. 
And these are the Blackhawk Singers again. There would have been, I'm sure, you know, ten times the turnout if it hadn't been pouring rain. It was and just drenching rain, and the wind started that afternoon as well. Right. There were all kinds of alerts on the media. Uh, you know, it's, it was almost a tropical storm, but uh, well, it, it was, was just relentless. The, it was Alberta was right coming, and the next day there was that tornado. Watches. Yeah, <laughs> right. But that didn't scare anybody either. Yeah, there was a, a tornado watch 19 miles south the next morning when we were at Sequoia. No, it was uh, for right that area. Yeah, it was for right there. An alert I to mean, take shelter right where right. And Nobody cared. <laughs> and one of the things that was said at the Mandalorian Symposium by someone about right. it, how nature is a participant in everything we do. So we just kept saying, well, nature is really participating. <laughs> and, and here we were all crying at all the events, so it made sense that the sky was crying along with us and lots of tears from heaven. <laughs> yeah. In the front there is Robin from Sierra Club who helped organize and got the uh, all the Sierra Club chapters to help out in all the cities that they stopped at. And behind her, in, the, in a very similar shirt to this, um, is Kurt, Kurt Russo, who is not technically <coughs> Rummy, but has been their project manager for a couple of decades for all sorts of activist programs like Stopping the Cherry Point coal terminal that they were able to, to stop successfully and, uh, and acquire a lot of land and so he's sort of their, their political uh, operator um, and he is fearless too. <laughs> he's great. So that night at Florida International University Oh, yeah, that. Sorry, <laughs> um, Right. I don't know. They've been looking at my leg all this time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to the line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is um, at uh, FIU and uh, this big mural uh, that everyone could uh, help to create. Uh, and Susan applied her artistry to it. Uh, and then the program began uh, with the, the Black Hawk Singers, of course. And this is uh, Jeff Schaff, uh, one of the documentary filmmakers. Uh, this is just so amazing to see. And this is Pablo from Chile. Juan Pablo. Juan, Juan Pablo. Juan Pablo Orrego. Very good. Well-known activist. Right. Uh, who has worked with Lummies in Chile to stop dam uh, production. They're down there to prevent dams, and they were mostly successful. Uh, and he's a poet and just a, a beautiful guy. And he uh, is a, a Miccosuke or Seminole, I'm not Sure, but uh, anyway, he had some beautiful things to say. And I don't have all of the speakers here. This is just, you know, a sampling of the amazing speakers <coughs> there. Uh, and Doug and Jewel again. And it was so emotional. Yeah. When Jewel got up to talk, and he usually has no problem, he couldn't. He couldn't even talk. It was just it. It affected him, he had to sort of stand back. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> but he was so heavily affected. It was incredible, as, as we all were. Well, what happened that night, everyone that spoke, um, I, and I think it started with Jewel, well, I'll say how they thought it was say what he he, he got up and at first I thought he was joking around because he was like at the podium to talk and then he just came like shit. shit. 
And, yeah. And I thought he was joking around with Doug, but he was... And I thought that would lead into a whole topic or yeah. something, but, but it, it was just he was choked up. He was Couldn't feeling help. some really deep <laughs> personal things from his past that he shared. And, you know, so we're all just in tears. And then the first Sam that we had just shown the picture of, he couldn't talk. And he, he had a flute and he was playing, and he told a story that really matched one of my personal stories, and so I like this bawling. And he told me later, he said, well, I was trying, I ended up talking about, <laughs> talking about a lost brother and something that happened with his flute. And he's like, I couldn't, I couldn't talk, so I would just talk a little bit, and then I would play my flute for a while because I couldn't talk, and then I would talk a little more. And, and Juan Pablo, the same thing. And everyone, and the whole audience that night, it was just, um, it's the most emotionally intense thing. And everyone said they ended up sharing something different. And then Robin, um, Jewel asked Robin and her daughter to come up and talk. And so she's sharing about seeing the captures and the mom and baby that she had become friends with that were in the nets for the weeks that they had them in Penn Cove are one ended up being one of the moms and babies that they found dead on the beach. Mm -hmm. And she saw that and she was sharing that and crying. And you know, it was the whole night. It was um, it was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced in um, yeah. just the spirit and energy was incredible. Amazing people. So, now this is the next morning, the 27th, the start of the actual march to the Sequarium at a, a big park across the causeway. Um, and again, pouring rain, driving wind, but these are the Black Hawk singers again, and Freddie, uh, and uh, Freddie Lane. Um, and of course, they all gave their native names first, and then their, their, their Western names. Uh, and, uh, oh, and Nick is the guy beside him. He was the one who had called me a year ago in June. Both of them council members. And uh, on the far left side is Lawrence Solomon, who is one of the Black Hawk singers and also a council member. So just so many rousing talks. Just and this was the, the whole tent was just this, the winds are blowing, the tropical storm and hit, it was pouring rain, a tornado warning, and it was all happening anyway. And there were at least 75 people there at the tent in the morning and over 100, I think, by the time we did the whole march, which was incredible. And yet the amazing thing was that the winds slowly died down as we began. I mean, we were already over to the Sequarium before they really quieted down. But, you know, the, the skies calmed down and uh, it, it, was, it was kind of nature participated again and said, okay, it's time. Uh, this was, uh, this teacher's class did this sort of pictorial cartoon version of the retirement plan, uh, which is kind of cool. I thought that was amazing. Hmm. Does it say action for? What is the sign? Uh, the caption above it say action for? Um, you know, I never could quite figure that out. What it says, uh, action for? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. hmm. um, and this is uh, Louis Aguirre, who is the ABC affiliate, Channel 10 in Miami, who gets it completely. It's so refreshing to work with media who understand and are willing to help. Oh yeah, sorry everybody. Um, so he was interviewing uh, Julianne, who is the daughter of Robin, who was the girl in Oak Harbor, who saw the captures. Uh, who had a petition. She went everywhere. And she was famously very shy. Didn't
didn't really like talking to people, but for her petition for Toki, she was out there. Uh, and so he was interviewing her. Great. And there was, you know, classes of artwork who, you know, did artwork were shown. Uh, oh, well, that's the other way. The same thing. Hi. I may have just lost the line, but you know, I know. Well, we must go on. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So then we started the march. Uh, it was yeah, a quarter mile across the causeway uh, out of the park. Uh, and it was led by the singers. Uh, okay, this is really poor video quality and probably audio too, but it was the best I could do. You know, it's from probably a phone video uh, onto Facebook and then onto my laptop and then uh, just with the video camera trying to pick it up. But it gives you a sense of how they sound it. a unifying feeling that they gave and it, it just has this sense of determination of pride of strength they're going to do this I mean they really they, that that singing really carried that message so uh, the totem uh, went of course right along with this driven by Jewel who is no nonsense. And riding along is Paul Anderson, their uh, sort of uh, trip photographer. And then we got to the Sequoia, to the sidewalk in front of the Sequoia. And there was a friendly security in the golf cart, you know, who looked us over. But it wasn't a threatening presence. I was really glad to see that. There were some uh, Miami-Dade sheriff's officers just sort of directing traffic and making sure everybody was okay. And they were thanked appropriately for being there. And so uh, there was no real interference. Of course, we stayed off their property. But there was plenty of room on the sidewalk in front. And that's uh, Nick again, Nick Lewis. Um, and he was you know, one of the three council members who were there. And again, if there hadn't been media scares about tropical storm and possible tornadoes, there probably would have been a whole lot more. But these were the fearless ones. Jewel got on the megaphone many times, reaching out to Sequoia um, and just saying, we're here for her, we're not going away. And Freddie as well. And the day before that, there had been some media where this uh, curator emeritus had said, the Lummies don't care about her. They're just doing it for their own purposes. Uh, and so they were answering him. Oh, we care. <laughs> and that's Jeff Schaff interviewing Doug James with Freddie looking on. And we played her family's calls to her. Okay. 
to the speakers up in here. somebody inside to be watching her that we couldn't get anyone inside that day. This campaign's gone to a whole new level. That's mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Uh, this is so refreshing, having been trying to argue to bring her home for over 20 years, to suddenly have this kind of passionate and powerful support. Uh, we now she now has some really powerful friends, and mm -hmm. it has real potential now. Lots of media. There's Alejandro with his billboard. He wears that all the time to the demonstrations and down the streets of Miami. And he reaches a big uh, Spanish speaking um, group of people. Uh, Alejandro. Right. And, oh, yeah. and Spanish media. He's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does Univision and every other he Spanish media all He's the time. Great outreach. Played some more calls for her. That's true. Thank you to one of you that came out. We sat together. We made for the credit for today. Thank you that we come stand together. So these are not performers in the sense that we normally understand performers. They're, they're builders of spirit, and, uh, and they really do convey that. Those songs just reverberated in my head. They still do. And that's Sylvia. Uh, and she is uh, a Miami businesswoman. Basically, she's a professional person who just gets it and has been helping organize things. She's sort of our Miami organizer in many ways. Uh, and she's very, very dedicated. That's the other TV station, Channel 7. They set up a, some, a cart that was playing music really, really loud in the parking lot, trying to drown us out. But 
Yeah, yeah. Finally gave that yeah up. it's really just the right. most obnoxious music. And they did it before the singers started or just when we got there. But I think they, once they saw there were two TV crews there and they knew the mummies were going to tell them how disrespectful that was, that uh, they turned it off pretty yeah. quickly. So this is Susan playing Falls with the megaphone. She won. And you said that's her tank straight, straight down. Yes, right past the oar. Those are the sounds of Buster. Buster went along on the entire journey. You meet Buster. aquarium right close to the tank. We went back across the road to the park for one big final parting group shot around the totem, all over the totem. Uh, so that was sort of the final bonding event. And Freddie and Jewel and several others gave power pack talks. And there's Buster, <laughs> our guide <laughs> and companion. And that's Lawrence on the right. And uh, Annette and Bella are the mother and daughter who uh, helped out in so many ways. She's a teacher that got her class to do those, uh, that, that big artwork. And so the totem pulled away from the park and headed back first to Gainesville and then they drove on across the country. So Buster <laughs> said, bye. <laughs> it's been wondrous. So the next day, uh, no, that afternoon, that afternoon, we went to a restaurant in Miami, downtown Miami, across the street from this. Um, and that is the, the, one of the walls of the campaign headquarters of Philip Levine running for governor. Hmm. Um, this is art Miami style. It says, uh, that is yeah, yeah, Lolita, and in case yeah. there's any mistake, there's a hashtag free Lolita in the upper corner there. Uh, hmm. It is pretty elaborate. You know, it get a lot of attention, it's so big. Oh, it did. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a 50 foot orca, is what it is. Wow. So we 
sort of uh, debriefed uh, with some sandwiches and beer. And that's Lawrence and Freddie again. So we had a good long time to just uh, talk about it, plan ahead. It was great. So that's where you can find more videos, uh, a lot of photos, a lot of stories of this whole trip. Mm -hmm. And both of those, those are uh, our shared responsibility is a Facebook page. SacredSea.org is also a Facebook, but also a website, so you can find out a lot more. Where, where so, can you find the trailer for the upcoming Ah, movie? well, on I'm, both of those. I'm sure it's on both of those. Yeah. Okay, because uh, yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah, it, 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 it is, and it played it a lot of times. You should watch, anyone should watch different. it. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, so, open to any inquiries? Yes. Um, I was telling Wendy, um, a couple of, I guess late May, I was on the Channel 7, I'm not sure what affiliate that is, but of Miami Channel 7 News, uh -huh. and they were running an ad on that. TV station for Aquarium, and so I watched it. It was a 50% off through the end of May. Right. And they showed the different sea creatures in the in this aquarium. They didn't mention Lolita or show her at all. Right. I know that's been the case for several years. Yeah. Uh, if you go to their website, and you can't even find. Yeah. It's really hard to find anything about her shows hmm. or. Yeah. You don't say when there's no time it be. I think they're trying to phase her out of the publicity. Uh, although she remains their big draw, their main you know, attraction. But uh, yeah, it, it's really kind of interesting that uh, they're, they're trying to not mention her as much as possible. Yes. Do you know, are, has their attendance for the shows gone down? At all? I, yeah, her, their, the attendance of the shows, uh, we can only estimate, and we you know, rarely get in. We have three people come in, and so you know, they can see there weren't that many people when we were there, but there was a tropical storm. Um, but no, it's proprietary information. This aquarium is one of the holdings of uh, basically a big conglomerate based in Madrid and they own about 65 I believe other mainly family water parks slides and rides uh, but they also own Marine Land Antibes in France which has now four orcas uh, and they own Sealand in Hawaii which has a dozen or more dolphins so they're invested in the industry um, but they are definitely the next phase of the campaign. And that's really up to the project manager at Lummi and the Lummi Council to figure out how to proceed. Um, but from the records we can find, the corporate records, they are hemorrhaging revenues from those parks. Mm -hmm. All three of them. Uh, both, uh, all three have a lot of controversy in France. The, the uh, environment minister passed a regulation requiring that all the tanks be rebuilt much bigger, which of course is uh, prohibitive, they'll never do that, but would mean they would have to shut down, which is how it worked in the UK in 1992. Uh, and that's why there's no dolphins in the UK. So that, mm. that happened, but then it got undone, but it's going to get redone. And meanwhile, the street protests and all the general public disapproval is growing by the day. So they've got real PR problems because of holding whales and dolphins in captivity. So we'll see. But uh, I, I think they're probably losing a lot of attendance. That's why they're giving it away. They're, yeah, discounts for veterans and teachers and you know, every kind of category of people just to get people in those seats. Mm -hmm. So, and they, uh, a season pass costs as much as a one day ticket. You buy a ticket, here, there's a season pass. So, I mean, they're, they're just trying to get people in to make it look like it's a thriving business, but uh, it's clearly not. 
So yeah, this can be a factor. Wendy? Howard, can you uh, explain quickly, Robin Knoll, that, um, that her daughter's the one taking the uh, petitions now, the age she was and what she did here on Whitby back during the captures? Yeah, right. I mean, this is a, a really heartfelt story. In fact, we just got a, uh, a email, I guess, or a text mm -hmm. that uh, they're, I think, still on their way up for this big event tomorrow in Seattle at the waterfront. Um, and somehow, Channel 5 called them. Lori Matsukawa from King 5 called them uh, and wants to set up an interview. She's going to, they told their whole story to her. She's going back to the producers. They'll be there for the event tomorrow. Um, and she's, you know, Robin, the mom, is, was a little girl when the captures happened and was so affected by it that her mom said, well, do something about it, you know, what, what would you like to do and I'll help. And that was basically to tell the teachers and all the kids and then other classes, pretty soon other schools, and it just spread uh, that uh, we got to stop this. And then, as a little girl, she gets a call from Senator Magnuson. And so she told the whole story to him. And you know, along comes the Marine Mammal Protection Act and a whole bunch of other environmental laws and, you know, restrictions. Mm -hmm. they, they, they started applying some limits. When the captures first started in the mid-60s, it was the Wild West. Go out and catch all you want. Um, but, you know, gradually, and a lot of it was because of Robin as a little girl, uh, the, the, you know, there became quotas and permits and monitors and and they started clamping down on it. And then it wasn't until 76 that it finally got shut down completely by a court order when the evidence of the dead whales that Robin had seen uh, became public. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah, that, so she'll yeah. be telling that tomorrow. And, and on then King her five. daughter is now doing petitions. Her yes. daughter now is her age when she, when the captures happened, her daughter now is doing petitions to bring Toki home. And so they were at the Hollywood event and the Miami event, and they'll be in Seattle tomorrow at the stand-up. And tomorrow's event is stand-up. Um, stand-up for, stand for Lolita. And there are events happening. Um, in 16 all of, cities. And all around, around the world. world. Not yeah. even, and there's some in Spain, um, right. where the Parcos mm -hmm. Reunitos, which is one of the you know, the owner of the corporation. Um, and these have become big rallies and big events. Mm. Um, so if you're able to come to Seattle tomorrow, it's at noon. Um, yep. And it's on our Facebook page. And if you just search for Stand Up um, for Lolita, you'll find them. Right. Mm. Right. Tomorrow at noon, Seattle. Yes, and Fred Seattle Center? Uh, no, at the waterfront. Uh, right there on Alaska Way between Pier 57 and 59. 57 and 59. Yes. Yeah. And Freddie and Jewel and Doug um, are all headed are down. all going to be there. Right. And, Nick, and I think Nick. Probably Nick, Nick too. too. Yeah. Think, yeah. So, so there will be a, a big Lummi contingent there. Yes. I was curious, you know, a lot of tribes have brought, successfully brought sacred objects back that were taken from yes. hundreds of years ago. Um, and there's the Repatriation Act to help them. Are the Lummies planning to sue over this and use that? I don't know. I would think so. Uh, you know, they're, they're working on their strategy. They've been focused on the totem journey to, to you know, just build their spirit to bring her back and let people know they're going to do it. Uh, so, but, you know, they're plotting too. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't know what their plans are. You know, we're, our whole role for over 20 years has been to show, first, she deserves to come home. My God, she's been in a box all that time. And if you know how whales live, that's atrocious. It's just a you know, horrible thing to do to her. And it's amazing she's still alive. And really more critically, that it can be done safely, that 
despite all the scare stories that we're hearing from not just Sequarium, not just the entire park industry, but from most of the scientific community, marine mammal scientists, are saying basically the same thing. And that has a lot to do with how the industry has supported the scientific community. All these years, since the first founding of the Society for Marine Mammalogy, uh, they host the conferences, they offer the scholarships, and they're the only jobs. So nobody wants to contradict uh, the, the marine parks. So they go along with that. Oh yeah, there, you might uh, catch a disease. Even though there are safeguards, there are protocols, it was done with Keiko, the same thing was said about Keiko, but you know, a team of veterinarians and pathologists in, you know, examined him, and uh, he got a clean bill of health, and he went to Iceland, and no problem. So she would need the same examination, for sure, for every known pathogen. So it's a non-issue. It's like saying, you know, you better not move into that house because it might burn down, not mentioning there's a fire department next door. You know, I mean, there's every kind of safeguard to keep that from happening, and it's routine, it's protocol. So, uh, you know, that's a scare story, but most of the scientific community still says that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's sort of what we're up against. So that's why I keep saying my main message now is she is healthy. It may be hard to believe. You know, she's 51 or 2, and she's been there, it'll be 48 years in August. Mm -hmm. So you would think, especially because all the others died decades ago, before 1987, that she's just too old, must be too weak. The, the trip, you know, being lifted out in a nice comfy fleece line sling uh, <laughs> and put into chilled water for, you know, an effortless trip back and then lowered gently into her home, that somehow that would shock her. That's what they say. Um, why? You know, where's the evidence for that? At what point is there any real danger? There really isn't. But that's a hard message to get across because people don't want to cross the industry. Um, so that's, that's my really important message now is that she is healthy and, you know, you've seen the evidence and, you know, I've got lots of videos of her. Um, and there's no reason to think that she can't just, you know, make that trip. She doesn't have to do much and uh, be just fine. It'll be monitored and with the, the least changes, with the same people, the same food at first. Same veterinarians will be monitored um, all the time. So, you know, there's no reason to think that she would suffer from the trip. And yet, that's what they say. So, I don't know, you know, I, I keep saying, look at her. Examine her, just, just you know, her, her energy level. Besides, also, because of a legal action, January 2016, expert witnesses got access to about 10 years of veterinary records. So they looked at everything she'd been treated for. And yeah, there are some stress-related uh, ulcers and some other issues that she is being, you know, she's given occasional you know, doses of antibiotics and things for. Those are stress-related. Captivity causes stress. When she comes home, she's in her backyard, she's in her familiar waters, no reason to think she'll still have those stresses. She'll, as Keiko did, he got completely over what was nearly his last days in Mexico City by being in natural seawater. So, you know, the record is clear. Her health is clear. There's no reason to worry. But we have a hard time getting endorsements from the scientific community because they don't want to cross the industry. So that's why I keep saying that. And that what gives us so much hope having the Lummies as partners um, is what Patricia was asking, you know, what legal angles are they taking? And just by the fact that they are a sovereign nation, so they are equal to our federal government, and they are 
able to, they have the right to ask for her back under their treaty rights, um, under you know their their sacred and spiritual beliefs that she is, at, you know, part of their family, and so they are coming at this at a whole different level than anything we've ever been able to do. That is so perfect, and and their wishes to also do it in, you know, as a way to bring attention to the the healing of the Salish Sea and bring back the salmon. It's it's just such a perfect partnership, and um, I don't think the Miami Seaquarium quite knows how to deal with this. <laughs> they don't. They don't. They're all over the map. You know, yes. you could ask Lolita. Yes. And um, would you like to come home to your family, your Oka family, and your Lummi Nation family? Uh, and uh, would you like to chance it? Or do you just want to stay here in this yeah. bathtub? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, how would She'd you say, do? duh. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Right. I know. I know. That should be obvious, too. But that, yeah. they deny that. They say, oh, no, she loves it there. Oh, yeah, right. That's all she knows. Well, she was about four when she was captured. Orcas are really precocious at birth. They learn. They're catching fish before a year old. Uh, they're vocalizing, communicating in their dialects that they learn uh, before the age of one. She was a fully, you know, competent member of her family, uh, and sharing, you know, all the rituals and behaviors and everything else that they do long before she was captured. Also, their brains are about five times the size of ours. So that's a lot of memory capacity. Um, and I think that it is those memories that keep her alive uh, and that will make it wonderful for her to come home. And there will be the eyes of the world. I mean, it's been said, and I agree, she is probably the most famous whale in the world today. And if we can get this project up and rolling and bring her back, the media attention will be just ginormous. And it'll stay because people are going to want to know how she's doing, what's her progress. And that will depend on how's her home, how's her habitat, what's going on to improve the environment here. That will bring a huge political force to doing the things that have to be done, to restoring the salmon, to cleaning up the water, to keeping the oil tanker traffic out of the Salish Sea. Everything else that needs to be done will be done for her, not an abstract environmentalist goal, uh, but for her. And that, I think, will really add emotional power to getting it all done. Yes. Um, well, that, back to what Susan was saying and what you just said about the condition of the Salish Sea and the lack of salmon, Does, and that's got to pose oh. a risk for her. Okay, right. And, so and, how do you answer that? Um, it was really difficult until the Lummies stood up because they not only <laughs> is that their traditional territory, they've also now uh, uh, they're in the final stages of acquiring that land where the sea pen will be, which is also a salmon hatchery. And besides the fact that, you know, they know their fish very, very well. And they vow they will never let her go hungry. And so they will have, you know, fish, salmon available for her for the rest of her life. And they will take care. They'll, they'll, they'll make sure. I mean, they're, they're the caretakers that are not going away. They're not a nonprofit. They're not a government. They're a nation. Yeah. And so they're gonna, they're gonna take care. So, you know, we, we recognized that and said we'll figure out a way. But you know, they have it. They have exactly how they're gonna do it and have promised it. So. Uh, yeah. And, and one other question, what, what's the future for the totem? You, you said it was in a okay. museum in Gainesville. Um, it, it was never really announced, but uh, the understanding was that it's, going, it's in Gainesville right now, and there's a museum of what, natural history or archaeology or something there, and uh, it will be on display with some other artifacts and totems 
that have never seen the light of day, that will be a whole new display, and uh, we're going back, or they're going back anyway, in September to do that. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be on display probably in Gainesville, as I understand. Yeah, I'm showing our, our Langley Whale Center audience to our live stream at Facebook. <laughs> and I want our, our visiting friends from Colorado who've seen Blackfish <laughs> three times. <laughs> and, I and I want to thank our, our live stream audience for putting up with our technical inabilities. And um, um, next time we will get a better dedicated live stream person or... <laughs> uh, well, with that, I hope they heard it all. I'm sorry. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Please help yourself to snacks and drinks here. We don't want to take them home. Yeah. Take some home.